In April of 1775, a farmer by the name of Daniel Shays responded to the call to arms at Lexington. Shortly after the Battle of Bunker Hill, Shays was commissioned as a second lieutenant in recognition of his bravery and the skill he demonstrated during the fighting. Shays spent the next five years with the Continental Army, eventually rising to the rank of captain before finally resigning to return home in 1780. After returning home, Shays was summoned to court for unpaid debts. He indicated he could not pay because he had not been paid in full for his military service, and he was not alone. Small farmers all across western Massachusetts were all in the same predicament, and many of them were veterans. In August of 1786, when the state legislature had adjourned without considering the petitions that had been sent to Boston, a group of protesters, Shea among them, marched on the Northampton courthouse and prevented the court from sitting. When a second court in Worcester, Mass., was shut down by similar actions, the militia was called out but refused to turn out, as many of the members of the militia were also members of the protest. On September 19th, the Massachusetts Supreme Court in Springfield indicted 11 of the protesters. However, when the court next met on September 26th, they were overwhelmed by protesters. William Shepard, a pro-government militia leader, had brought 300 men, but they were simply outnumbered by the protesters who had taken to calling themselves the Regulators. Shepard came back on the 28th with 800 men hoping to hold the court, but he was met by 1,200 Regulators. The 800 men had to withdraw to the Springfield Armory, which was rumored to be the next target. As the protesters continued to shut down courts in other parts of Massachusetts, the Speaker of the Massachusetts House, James Warren, wrote to John Adams, We are now in a state of anarchy and confusion bordering on civil war. Unfortunately for Massachusetts, because of the limitations of the Articles of Confederation, there was little the federal government could do. The same issues that prevented them from raising money to pay the veterans also prevented them from raising money to recruit soldiers to fight the insurrectionists. Seeing that no help was going to be coming from the weak federal government, the Massachusetts governor asked the wealthy merchants of the East to help him raise money for a militia there, but those folks would take some time to get to the West. He asked Shepard to stop guarding the federal armory and actually seize all the weapons there to arm his own militia. On January 25, 1787, about 2,000 farmers did in fact try to, try to take the federal armory at Springfield. However, Shepard and his men were ready. The farmers came with pickaxes and muskets, but the militia had cannons. Two warning shots were fired, and then one shot was fired into the crowd, killing two and wounding twenty. While the protesters fled and attempted to regroup, the failure to seize the armory was functionally the end of the rebellion. Later that same year, approximately 4,000 people signed confessions acknowledging participation in the events of the rebellion in exchange for amnesty. Several hundred participants were eventually indicted on charges relating to the rebellion, but almost all of these were pardoned under a general amnesty, including Shea. But Shea's rebellion, as it would come to be known, showed yet another example of the federal government's weakness under the Articles of Confederation. Prior to the rebellion, Massachusetts had been one of the largest anti-federalist hotbeds, but seeing the failure of the federal government to come to the aid of Massachusetts and the near overthrow of the government made clear to Massachusetts that the convention was necessary and a new constitution was needed. But Massachusetts still was wary of having a strong federal government with a standing army. Massachusetts had a Declaration of Rights written in 1780 that provided, The people have a right to keep and bear arms for the common defense. And as in time of peace, armies are dangerous to liberty, they ought not to be maintained without the consent of legislature, and the military power shall always be held in exact subordination to the civil authority and be governed by it. This was a concern shared by all states, and so the Constitution was written in such a way that there would be limits on the size of the standing army, while still giving the federal government authority over local militias. The Constitution that was ratified did not include a Bill of Rights, but it did include four references to militia. The first was in Article 1, Section 8, where it indicated that Congress had the power to provide calling forth of the militia to execute laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions, also to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them that may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. The fourth reference came under Article 2, Section 2, outlining the powers of the executive branch. It indicated the president should be the commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and the militia of the several states. In arguing for the ratification of the Constitution, Alexander Hamilton wrote an entire article in Federalist 29 regarding the militias. It starts, The power of regulating the militia and of commanding its services in times of insurrection and invasion are natural incidents to the duties of superintending the common defense and of watching over the internal peace of the Confederacy. He made clear that the power being given to the federal government to control the local militias was intended to prevent the federal government from having a need for a large standing army. It also needs to be remembered that the Constitution initially signed did not contain the Bill of Rights. 
Although George Mason stood up and proposed, including a full Bill of Rights, he was voted down by a vote of 10 to 0. As Roger Sherman put it, the state declaration of rights are not repealed by the confirmation and being enforced are sufficient. The debate over how much control the federal government would have over state militias and whether or not the federal government would be able to have a standing army was only one of many items that were fought during the Constitutional Convention. There were many compromises, but what really mattered was the Articles of Confederation had failed. But once the Constitution was ratified, a new nation was formed, and this new government had inherited a great deal of the Revolutionary War debt. The new Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, believed that taxes on imported goods had been raised as high as they possibly could, and that some sort of new domestic tax was needed. In weighing your options, Congress decided the least objectionable thing to tax would be domestically produced distilled spirits. The logic being distilled spirits were generally a luxury item, and that many social reformers were actually in favor of taxing these types of items because of the harmful effects of alcohol. But in western Pennsylvania, resistance to the tax was almost immediate. On September 11, 1791, a recently appointed tax collector named Robert Johnson was tarred and feathered. When a man was sent by officials to serve warrants on those who attacked Johnson, he himself was whipped, tarred, and feathered, all of this mirroring behaviors during the American Revolution against taxes. As a result, the so-called whiskey tax went largely uncollected throughout the western portions of states that bordered the Appalachians. Throughout this time, Congress is also debating the addition of amendments to the Constitution that would later become the Bill of Rights, starting first with 17 articles, then reduced to 12, and finally becoming the 10 we're familiar with. Two of these amendments, the second and the fifth, made specific reference to militias. Madison's original version of the second read, The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, a well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. However, after a debate in the committees, the Militia Clause was moved first, and the religious exemption was removed entirely. There was some debate as to whether the clause should include a restriction on standing armies during peacetime, but it was decided that it would not be included. The Fifth Amendment was primarily around double jeopardy, indicating no person shall be subject to except in cases of impeachment to more than one trial, or one punishment of the same offense, nor shall should be compelled in any criminal case to be witnessed against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, and property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken with public use without just compensation. However, an exception was added, in, except in cases regarding the land or naval forces or in the militia. The militias of each state being viewed as a military force under the control of the federal government was made even more clear by the Militia Act of 1792. This law stated that the president had the authority to call up militias of the several states, quote, whenever the United States shall be invaded or in imminent danger of invasion by any foreign nation or Indian tribe. It also included specifics around insurrections, indicating the president could call out forces to suppress insurrections within states, either with the permission of the state legislatures or if the state legislators couldn't adjourn by his own authority. The Second Militia Act of 1792, passed within a week of the first, also allowed for the conscription of every free, able-bodied white male citizen between the ages of 18 and 45. By 1794, the protest in western Pennsylvania of the whiskey tax had escalated to near-insurrection levels. U.S. troops had been killed, and there was a protest that was threatening to march on Pittsburgh with over 7,000 men. Washington used the power of the Militia Acts to conscript an army of almost 13,000 men. Liberty polls were raised at recruitment sites as the conscription was not very popular, but it still proceeded. Washington personally led the force of 13,000 to western Pennsylvania, where the violent protest dissipated without a shot. It was clear now that the federal government did have the power to enforce law. In 1795, the president's ability to call it the militia was made permanent. The Militia Act of 1808 specifically gave federal funds to states for funding and arming state militias. The Militia Act of 1903 formalized this and created what is now known as the National Guard. All this is to say, Washington and the Congress believed that a well-regulated militia was needed to execute the laws of the Union and suppress insurrections. History is awkward.